Hello, uh, my name is Mark Lubell. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis. Um, I'm a political scientist by training, but I'm kind of the jack of all trades, environmental social scientist in, in, in reality. So I do a lot of work on cooperation problems in the context of environmental policy and governance, and also a ton of work on agricultural decision making, which is the work that is relevant to this brief presentation that I'm going to make to you on perspectives on agricultural decision making for environmental practices. Um, all my information is here on the on the on the slide here. So I guess the way I think of this is that what you would like is an, an overview of some of the theoretical perspectives for understanding agricultural decision making and then a few empirical examples. So that's what I'm going to provide. And hopefully this recording is going to work and uh, yeah, I'm kind of navigating this on Zoom. So, so I'm going to um, briefly discuss five different uh, perspectives on um, agricultural decision making that are used in the scientific literature. I would say that all of them are basically have the goal of predicting what sorts of practices individual growers are going to, to um, adopt. And all of them are thinking like, what are the independent variables? And with the dependent variable being the practice, practices that are adopted, there is a lot of overlap in terms of the variables that they indicate, but um, you know, it's worth talking about each of these. So I'm gonna go through one slide on each of these and then I'm gonna show you some empirical data. So the most classic theory is definitely uh, diffusion of innovation theory. Um, it goes all the way back to a paper published in 1943 talking about um, adoption of hybrid seed corn and has this um, famous uh, bell curve that you see down here that's like looking at um, the rate of adoption with early adopters and, and uh, late adopters and a bell curve shape around that. Uh, the cumulative number of adoptions over time, thinking of the innovation spreading through the population. And this is definitely, I'd say, the dominant approach to, to understanding agricultural decision making. It goes back a long time. It uh, is used in a lot of other fields beyond agricultural decision making. It basically thinks about uh, farmers choosing behaviors where the benefits outweigh the costs, but there is a social piece there too. Um, where the information about the innovation is spread through social networks or outreach programs to think about, you know, what are, so make sure the grower knows that the innovation exists, they know how to do it, that they know how to, um, uh, that the benefits outweigh the costs, and, and mo mostly the, the innovations that spread are ones that are sort of economically viable. Uh, there are psychological variables that are brought into the theory at various times, attitudes, values and things like that, but that's not really been the central focus of it. Other variables that are talked about in the theory are, are like the characteristics of the innovations um, as, as other things that you can think about as well. But this is the, the, the basic idea. At the next level up, this is really more from social psychology, the theory of planned behavior. And the theory of planned behavior is really trying to understand the uh, the link between people developing an intention to engage in a behavior and actually doing the behavior um, with the idea that it's very often the case that people do develop an intention, but they actually don't do it. Like, you know, you'd like to um, do more exercise, and but you never end up going to the gym sort of thing. Um, so usually the dependent variable in the theory of planned behavior is something like the intention to follow a nutrient management plan and actually doing it. So I have a, 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 a nice diagram here from a paper uh, that uses this theory in the context of agricultural decision making. And if you do, you know, Google search on this, you'll find many, many papers that use this theory. So you see the dependent variable being the intention, and then the proximate independent variables being like the attitudes towards the innovation. Do you perceive it to have a benefit? It's the subjective norms that come from social pressure. So that goes beyond just using the social network to inform, but uh, also thinking about, you know, social pressure that may come from other farmers or other people in the social environment of the farmer about is it the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do and then perceived behavioral control um, is it does the grower find it easy or difficult to engage in that behavior do they think they can actually do something about solving the problem 
In this particular paper, they also look at the kind of the context for decision making, the policy, education, and trusted sources that's out there that may influence those individual level attitudes, norms, and perceived behavioral controls. So that is also a fairly common strategy in studies of agricultural decision making is thinking about linking the context in which the a grower operates to the individual level attitudes and decisions that then end up influencing their behavior. So a lot of the work that I've personally done is, is focused on the cooper cooperation problems involved with agricultural best management practices. So um, what you see in the graph here is uh, um, some research we did on sustainable viticulture. So we were looking at um, uh, you know, wine grape growers, I, uh, beliefs and perceptions of lots of different practices around pest management, disease management, weed management, etc. We had them rank the economic benefits to the farm and their perceived environmental benefits. And there's a quadrant of practices up there in the Northwest there that have like a lot of environmental benefits, but not a lot of economic benefits back to the farmer. So that means that things like say not um, uh, non-point source pollution control around water, it's like, it's a good, if the farmers do something, it doesn't go, the benefit doesn't go right back to the farm, but there are social benefits that go to the environment. And the only way to achieve those social benefits are for the farmers to collectively work together, to cooperate, and there's no free riding. Um, and, and those sorts of practices are common, are, you know, common around environmental management, sustainability. But then there's also practices like in the um, Northeast quadrant there, innovation practices, uh, which we call kind of high priority. They have strong environmental benefits and also benefits to the farm. And some people would use the term best management practices to, to describe those and look, and that's kind of the sweet spot where you link innovation theory to cooperation, where you have practices that have a payoff both economically for the farm, farm productivity or profit, and they also have environmental benefits of some sort. Um, pest management, I think actually goes into that quite a bit. Um, but pest management also has an issue with cooperation when you think of the necessity for area-wide management. If one grower fails to do pest management, that's a vector for the pests to spread. So um, there's a guy here at UC Davis I do work with named Neil McRoberts. We look a lot at uh, um, citrus greening disease and, and area-wide management for that. So a lot of times in pest management, you have those sorts of spillover effects where the decision making of one grower has consequences for how other growers experience benefits and costs. And in those cases, you need cooperation. Um, social learning and culture is another perspective that kind of elaborates. Um, and I would say that the the in this particular um, graph, the main point of elaboration is around um, the social learning aspect. So you can kind of think of growers having three types of learning, social learning, like from other people, technical learning that they might have from programs, and then experiential learning, which they do over time as they, uh, you know, grow a crop every season or engage in a pest management or irrigation management practice. They see how effective it is, and then they change their practices through their own individual experience. So cultural change means it's kind of like diffusion of innovation in terms of, you know, a, a, a behavior spreading through a population, but it could also be a norm spreading through a population or a value spreading through a population. And that can happen through different types of social learning that happens in networks and the types of strategies that people use, I think you'll be familiar with. So conformity is a type of social learning strategy where you do what everybody else does. So if you see most of the people in your um, town that are you know, doing a particular type of pest management, you will conform to what the majority of people are doing. But another really common one in agriculture are prestige-based social learning and success-based social learning. So if you go into any county in California and ask like, who are the best farmers in California? A lot of people will nominate the same people. And, and, and they will use those people as models for their own decision-making around agriculture. And, and that's because those particular farmers may have prestige 
Uh, they may be politically well recognized. They may have been in the community for a long time. Um, they may be like the leaders in the Farm Bureau or something like that, and they and they're uh, known as leaders in the agricultural community and become opinion leaders in um, the decision making or success based. So the farmer who's done really well in terms of uh, you know developing new markets or having a lot of acres, making a lot of money in agriculture is in, in some somebody to emulate. Prestige and success very often travel together. I've found in agricultural communities, but that. But I think everybody knows that, you know, getting um, those opinion leaders on board with uh, different sorts of management programs is a, is a really important uh, aspect. And then lastly, I'll talk about adaptive decision making in agriculture. And, and this idea is like trying to um, make sure that you uh, think about how things change and how adaptation happens over time. So when you're talking about climate change, um, the original work where we where we came up with this model is really in rangeland management and thinking about how rangeland managers in California are going to adapt to climate change. Are they going to use different sorts of rotational grazing? What are their spatial and temporal strategies for moving animals around? So how does that adaptation happen over time and recognizing that there's a lot of variability both in the social and ecological system? So like on the left there in the ecological system, you may have a ranch that, uh, you know, is uh, has different types of um, drought outcomes. They may mix private and public land in different ways. They may be up in the Sierra Nevada mountains versus in the valley, all kinds of differences um, that are there. Um, I happened to be at a talk the other day that Karen Ross, the California Secretary of Agriculture, said and she actually had a quote that was very germane to this. She said, if you've seen one farm, you've seen one farm. In other words, it's like you can't really um, expect the same exact set of practices to uh, work for every single farm because there's so much variance in what people grow, the structure of their land holdings. How they how they organize their operation, what they know, what their capacities are, how things are changing over time in their particular type of operation, their particular type of crop. Um, so that adaptation and dealing with that spatial and heter spatial and temporal variability is what is emphasized in theories of adaptive decision making in agriculture. So that's an overview of the theoretical perspectives that I think are the most important ones and some of the ideas that they contain. Now I'll give you a little bit on um, some uh, empirical data on, on these ideas from farm farmers in California. And uh, um, for better or worse, I've probably sent more farmers to, or more surveys to farmers in California than almost any other researcher. So I do a lot of, um, over the past, I've been here since 2002, I've done a lot of uh, research um, where we survey farmers uh, by, usually we uh, identify them through the um, county um, pesticide permits that are public information in California. Uh, we also do a lot of qualitative interviews, working with grower groups and and Farm Bureau and leaders and things and extension agents. Um, but this is just a partial list from of of some of the surveys we've done. Um, Sacramento Valley farmers around water quality regulation, Central Coast farmers around water quality regulation. Had a big study on sustainability and viticulture, looking at Lodi, Central Coast, and Napa County, which I think this group that I'm speaking to here are probably very interested in. California ranchers, Yolo County farmers on climate change attitudes. Um, now, right now, I'm doing a, a bunch of work with more nutrient management work um, in, in California. So we are doing more surveys, um, mostly in the context of grower meetings that extension agents are doing. Um, you can ask me about that in the Q&A if you like. I don't have any of that data here yet. but you, so there's a lot of stuff that I can draw on and lots of papers you'll see at the end that we've written around this. So this is the, the typical um, type of uh, thing that people are interested in the, in these contexts is like practice adoption is a key dependent variable. So what practices do growers adopt? Um, if you're talking about pest, pest management or whatnot, um, this is the data from our, our viticulture work where we um, had many different categories of, of um, practices, mostly drawn from the various sort of sustainability workbooks. So this isn't all of them, but like a sample that our expert panel 
a recommended we study and you can see like disease management up there at the top is pretty frequent for a lot of them because that's like key to vineyard health um, but things like um, looking more at like uh, uh, water quality and things like that are more at the bottom. The high cost practices tend to be at the bottom. The more technically sophisticated practices tend to be at the bottom. But I think if you stop on the slide and stare at it for a while, there's a lot, you'll find a lot of uh, resonance with those of you who have worked in, in uh, uh, viticulture management and wine grapes before. Here's another, uh, this is from our Yolo County work, looking at climate change attitudes. So adaptation practices and mitigation practices. Um, I think one of the things that you can see here is that the, 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 um, the higher cost practices tend to be at the bottom, but also a really important thing. And, and I think when you look at the adaptation practices in particular, is that the farmers per, uh, prefer to uh, adapt at what we might call the intensive margin, what economists would call the intensive margin, the input side of things. So pumping more groundwater, uh, changing their irrigation, um, changing the way they do surface water. Um, and we know that in California, whenever there's a drought, the number one adaptation practice, which is quite problematic, is pumping more groundwater. And we have a lot of issues going around with that right now. But then if you look at the bottom, at the extensive margin, like the outputs, that's the least likely thing they want to do. So like um, shifting to less water intensive crops. Like if you're a tomato grower, you don't want to change your crops. You want to change your inputs first so that you can keep growing your crop because it's much more costly and difficult to change the extensive margin and change things in a major way in terms of how you're doing things, the, the, the type of systems that you have in place versus adjusting the inputs. Um, this Another type of dependent variable might be participation in programs. So this is our work with California ranchers and looking at the environmental programs that they participate in. California Williamson Act is like a top one with, that gives incentives for keeping land in agriculture, equip, <laughs> the Farm Bill and USDA, conservation easements, conservation reserve programs. So there's some very popular programs and then like a set of programs which are less frequent. So they have you can count up like the number of programs that, that ranchers participate in. And then we do some re analysis of what makes farmers participate in programs. So this is from the viticulture work and showing that uh, farmers that are uh, make have a higher gross annual income and more acres are tend to adopt more of the sustainable viticulture practices. And that's a very typical finding, I would say, like most of the time that you find that scale matters a lot in terms of farmer demographics. Like uh, more uh, wealthy farmers and larger acreage, which of course kind of go together, are more likely to participate in programs and, and be more innovative in their practices. Um, this graph shows the probability of adopting different types of practices based on their um, social networks. So in the x-axis here is a measure of how dense their social networks are, how many social network connections they have. The y-axis is the probability of adopting a particular type of practice. And then the three panels are practices that we kind of measure the relative, relative benefits and costs. And it shows that um, the uh, likelihood, not one that the, the, the likelihood of adopting practices overall is higher for the ones with the benefits that exceed the cost, but also that networks matter more for the more uh, beneficial practices. So in terms of accelerating diffusion, it, they, it tend, the, the networks tend to focus more on those practices that are viewed as high, having higher benefits and costs. And same thing with program participation. So this is basically the same type of model, uh, but the x-axis here is the number of program sustainability partnership programs that they participated in. And it shows that participation in sustainability programs does accelerate practice adoption on average, but that, that acceleration is concentrated again on practices where the benefits tend to outweigh the costs from the economic perspective rather than where the um, where the where it tends to be more like just environmental benefits and not as many economic benefits. So there's a challenge there in those cooperation problems in that uh, the the both the networks and the program participation are not as effective at uh, increasing adoption uh, of, pra of practices that are viewed as having not much benefit directly back to the grower. 
And a really important piece of all of this is social networks is learning pathways. So that's another, you know, beyond like the scale and the program participation, there's been a lot of attention and work on social networks as learning pathways for social learning. And this gives you an idea of how we tend to measure these things. So we'll, ha we'll have a survey and we'll ask people, um, you know, all the, all the information sources they might they might choose from. And you can kind of see the list there for wine grape growers on the left with a colored graph. And then the black and white one is for um, uh, ranchers. And one of the important things to realize in agriculture is that their social networks and their information sources varies by sector. So, for example, if you look at uh, there, the top one pest control advisor, um, that's and UC Cooperative Extension going down for wine grape growers. Pest control advisor is really high. Wine uh, Cooperative Extension about in you know in the middle. But if you go up to if you look at ranchers, they very rarely use consultants or pest control advisors, um, and they use Extension a lot. So like there's a lot of variance in those information resources. Um, other farmers is always important. Uh, uh, piece of the story and also their own experience is all always um, uh, important piece of the story that they will talk about. So like, for example, in the vineyard one, observations of own vineyard conditions, trial and error, those are kind of like the individual learning pathways. This is the first picture of social networks in wine grape growers in California. So this is kind of a Hubble telescope picture that shows um, that uh, what, what, what we did is we asked growers which other growers they talked to and which cooperative extension. We actually did it by name. So we were able to like trace out their network connections and these are what the networks look like. And the, the uh, circles are individual gr people, growers or extension agents. The uh, links are if they talk to each other, communicate with each other. Um, the people who are just growers are kind of the bluish color. People who are just outreach, like just consultants or cooperative extension are the yellow color. And the both, they they do like consulting or, the, or they may be an extension agent who's also a grower, they're in purple. And it turns out that um, in terms of like the most central actors in these networks are the people who are the both. So that's what you should have on the squares here. In the, the X axis here is this uh, major centrality in those social networks in all three regions. Um, the both the people who span the boundaries, they can talk they can talk with the grower from the perspective of a grower and like a pest control advisor. They're the ones who are the most central in networks and get the most reliance for advice. Um, the people who are just growers are below that. And then interestingly, if you look at the uh, people who just do outreach, like the consultants, or their only consultants or their only cooperative extension agents, they're the lowest, but they also have a high coefficient of variation, which is on the left, at the left, the y-axis there. And that means the coefficient of variation means like they're either high or low in the network. So you have like uh, some consultants who are really well connected in the network they have a lot of clients they're well respected and other people they may be new they're on the fringe they don't do as much so there's like a lot of variance in where the outreach and consultant people live in these networks um this is also showing how uh, another uh, more recent study um about nitrogen management and here um what we're looking at is like uh, whether or not people um, said that they were going to learn different levels of learning in their nitrogen management plans and their farm evaluation plans are required to do in California for irrigated lands management. And what you see here is that the more information sources they have, the more likely they are to indicate learning from doing the planning itself. So that's an actual interesting piece of the whole nitrogen management story is that the nitrogen management story doesn't require them to do any practices or require them to um, actually uh, uh, limit their applications of nitrogen, which is much different than like, for example, in Europe with the, uh, uh, the, the nutrient management directors at the EU. So it's, not, it's a non-regulatory approach, but it does require them to do a nitrogen management plan and farm evaluation plan. And it's like an in, information basis. And it, those activities of doing the planning in, seem to enable people to learn how to do things better. So that's kind of good news is like a non uh, and not a more voluntary approach or kind of quasi voluntary approach is, is having some potential learning benefits for growers beyond, even without specific mandates. 
Um, so in conclusion, uh, hopefully I haven't gone too long, um, agricultural management adoption uh, involves multiple social processes, um, practices, um, uh, the costs are more important in terms of like what people pay attention to, to the benefits, but overall benefit practices that been where the benefits outweigh the cost are tend to be adopted. I mean, that's supposed, I guess that's not a rocket science there. Um, no, local social networks and programs are key to behavior change, but their effectiveness is really concentrated among those practices where the that has economic returns to the growers and less so among the so-called cooperation practices where the economic returns to the growers aren't as obvious. Um, there's always a scale thing, larger and more wealthy farmers. That, you know, there is variance there if you look at different sorts of studies, organic agriculture, the emergence of more small-scale farms this is a place where um, we can we can have some debate about that. Um, and certainly is greatest for high cost, low benefit practices. So those practices tend to not to be adopted very much. It's like also practices where there's not a lot of information out there. The growers don't seek information. So there's a role for extension agents out there to do that. To do that. And then there's really dynamic relationships over time between all of these things. So like as growers make decisions over time and adapt to things like changing climate or changing pest pressures, you know, it's all these things kind of co-evolve together. So it's hard to disentangle causality um, because they're all they're all uh, dynamically integrated with each other. So that's it. Um, and I'm going to stop this now. And I look forward to hearing your questions during our session.